when we're live. All right, in the vast universe of Star Trek, one character has risen above the rest with her intelligence, courage, and determination. Her name is Michael Burnham, and she is a force to be reckoned with. From the moment she stepped on the screen, Burnham has captivated audiences with her strength and resilience. Despite facing numerous challenges and obstacles, Burnham always rises to the occasion and proves herself to be unstoppable. Her journey is a testament to the power of perseverance and the ability to overcome any odds. Whether she's facing down an enemy in battle or outsmarting her adversaries with her cunning tactics, Burnham always comes out on top. Thanks for watching the video, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Jason. Okay, first of all, uh, so we're talking about Burnham, but I think we should talk about Shaniqua Martin Green, right, uh, who plays Burnham. Um, I love Shaniqua as Michael Burnham. I think the, the name kind of sucks, but I, I love Shaniqua as Michael Burnham. I think the only downfall she has is one she whispers a little too much and two she cries a little too much um but i think Tanika martin martin green would be a great action hero outside of star trek and doing something else i think she as as a black woman um i think there are other like i would have loved to have seen her in top gun Right, like like the new Top Gun Maverick. I think she should have been a pilot on that show. I think that her, uh, uh, what do you call those people who work for you when you're an actor? Agents are not doing her well. I think Nico Martin Green should be doing other things outside of Star Trek. Because I think she's just a great action hero. I think she's, uh, you know, really good. Do you guys agree or not agree? I don't necessarily agree. Um, I saw her in The Walking Dead, and her character was complete. Well, I'm not going to say it was completely different, but um, she didn't do a lot of whispering. She um, she she held a screen. She held people's attention. I think it has a whole lot to do with either the character, the writers, or her directors. But I, I think a lot of what we're seeing from her particular character might have a whole lot to do with the content that she's right. been asked to to deliver. Yeah. So I don't I don't I don't judge Sonequa for what we're seeing on the screen. Um I, I, I yeah. It was terrible when she when she died on The Walking Dead. It was like what the fuck? Spoiler alert. I haven't gotten to that episode. Really? No, I'm joking. I was gonna say, <laughs> dude, it's been like 10 years. I mean to be fair, I haven't seen it. <laughs> So, yeah, really? I actually haven't seen it. Oh, yeah, I've seen, they like, got... I think it's all like season one of The Walking Dead, which is before it got good. Oh, I've saw. Yeah, I've seen all The Walking Dead, and I was really pissed at the the last season because it didn't have Rick or Michonne in it. And now they're trying to put out a new series with Rick and Michonne. Like, oh, is this the ones who live? Yes, and I loved it. Is oh, it already out? It's yes, already out. the first, first episode, episode came out this week. By now, well, I'm assuming that because because I didn't catch it on the day that, that that it came out, so I just assumed that I was like very late. So I'm I'm assuming at this point that you know episode two has come out. But you watched you watched all the Walking Dead. I watched all the Walking Dead except the very last season. Right. So the whole last season, we everybody was waiting for Rick and Michonne. It was like what? Like where are they? they because they knew this series was coming out. <laughs> right. Anyway, so this is Star Trek, and Sonequa Martin Green dies on Walking Dead, which sucks on the show, but it left her open to do Michael Burnham because if she hadn't died on Walking Dead, she would not be playing Michael Burnham, right? It was like the actually, year after that, right? Actually, she got the job for Star Trek, and because she got the job for Star Trek, that's why her character died. On the oh, was that was that the deal? Yes. Okay. Hmm. All right, it was well worth it then, you know. Um, so she's our first black lead, black female lead, because we had Cisco, black male lead, and then we have her as the black female lead. Um, we had Janeway, first female lead, right? And she wasn't even a captain. That's what was 
Well, so actually, so n neither was Benjamin Sisko, though. So, yep. um, but do we feel like 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 so? She was awesome. She can do everything. Do we feel like she is a she's just competent and awesome, or do we feel like she's a Mary Sue? I don't know that reference. So, uh, yeah. Mary Sue is an awesome bitch that can do fucking anything. Yeah, Basically. like she's generally referred to like, like she's generally like a self-insert character, right? Like that has plot armor, nothing can go wrong. Um, there's a really great like my friend Kevin Volk actually did a whole comic called Ensign Sue Must Die with this kind of playing with the concept of a Mary Sue in a Star Trek environment. Right. Well, uh, well, that doesn't explain to Jermaine what a Mary Sue is. Right. I mean, she's basically, like I said, she's a self insert yeah, character. Yeah. She it's, not die. Right. Like, uh, I mean, Mary Sue, Jermaine, is a, is a female that is overly competent because she's a female. It's just like, we're going to put a female in this role and we're going to make her way more competent than an average character in the show. I, I would say more it's it's considered a character that has earned some sort of that people feel that uh, hasn't earned the respect or the uh, skill set that they seem to show off. Like I, I hear a lot about Ray in the Star, Star Wars uh, sequel trilogy that she she's a Mary Sue because. Um, According to Wikipedia, a Mary Sue is a character archetype in fiction, usually a young woman, who is often portrayed as inexplicably competent across all domains, gifted with unique talents or powers, liked or respected by most, most other characters, unrealistically free of weaknesses, right. extremely attractive, innately virtuous, and or generally lacking meaningful character flaws. Usually female and almost always the main character, a Mary Sue is often an, offer, an author's idealized self-insertion and may serve as a form of wish fulfillment. Hmm. Very good. Good place for us to play the intro. Let's go with the intro and then <laughs> we'll know exactly what it is that we're talking intro, about. 10 minutes in. Every other vote. <laughs> I mean, I just want to know what we're going to be ready. Oh, wait, we're going live. Here we are. Welcome once again to Trekkers the Light. Like, literally, my mic falls down just as we go live. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Why okay. is that person not even moving behind you? That's what you're paying attention to? On a scale of one to ten. Oh, my God, no. Love that baseball and the teacup. Like, clearly, TNG DS9 fans. So. This was a nice touch. <laughs> the moan. The moan. <laughs> uh, no, everybody, this is actually one of the main screenwriters for Prodigy. So we are super excited oh, to hear wow. from you. And no also, I'm a little in the being critical. <laughs> That's Man, I really love that intro. So Every Maria, I have a quick question. Line of the of the intro, I love how just self serving that is. Will <laughs> right. Mar so be because you know, not to call out the obvious, but Mar Marie, you're the resident woman of the cast. Um, what really? are your thoughts about uh, <laughs> about Burnham? Is she a Mary Sue? Is she not a Mary Sue? I mean, just listening to to what Jason said, I would say she's not a Mary Sue. For well, yeah. M Marie, what are your thoughts? I, I don't think she is. Um, I think I think Michael Burnham actually gets a lot of like a really bad rap for it, and a lot, I think a lot of the criticism is unfair. Um, I do think I think that a lot of the writing in seasons one and two is weak? Yes, yes, I do. 
And I think that's part of the problem. But it's but Burnham is flawed, deeply flawed. In fact, she, you know, she is making bad choices. We know she's making bad choices. And she's making bad choices because you know, she's trying to compensate for the fact that her family died and then she gets adopted by Sarek and Sarek's A plus parenting fucks her over just as badly <laughs> as it does Spock. Right. I um, and so she's, I mean, she's she's coming from this incredibly traumatic background. She's not inexplicably good at everything. In fact, she messes up a lot. And I, and I get that there's some criticism to be said that she doesn't start off as captain, but I kind of like the idea that we're taking this character um, and watching her overcome these issues and learn to be better. Um, and that's not something a Mary Sue does. I think it's bad that we have been talking about Mary Sue, even though I'm, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the person that brought it up. Like, nobody is questioning Ethan Hawke in Mission Impossible for knowing and being and doing too many fucking things, right? Like, nobody, nobody's I'm questioning. Sure there's Tom actually Cruise. a body of criticism on that. But I don't know. I think I think that when when men are Mary Sue, nobody gives a fuck. Like it's, they're it's men, awesome. they're just awesome. <coughs> Luke right? Skywalker. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> something something Star Wars shaped uh, got lodged. But that's only pe that's only people that are like in drenched in actual the narrative and the story, and they really read into it and focus on it. It's not like the random person that's just going to watch the movie, right? Or just going to watch the show, like. I think, uh, I think it's a little sexist. The whole Mary. Oh yeah, Sue. absolutely. I think that's. I think that's part of the problem. Okay. I think. I think there are legitimate criticisms you can make of the writing and how Burnham has been phrased and and portrayed. I think there are legitimate criticisms to make, but a lot of that gets drowned out by by this this very targeted misogyny. Yeah. And. I and it doesn't escape my notice that Burnham is actually getting more crap that even than Janeway did because, you know, yeah. there's the whole racial aspect of it, too. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I watched, Harry um, really kind of moved the rock for the Star Trek fandom and a lot of really ugly things started crawling up. And I think as a fandom, we've had to confront it. Well, there were things that people didn't like about discovery right they didn't like people didn't like the, the, the klingons right um that was probably the biggest dislike of discovery for maybe. me it still is the biggest um <laughs> I, I i recently watched the first season over the past week and i fuck and i'm fucking loving it like i, I i'm like this is really good shit like hands down for Star Trek and just as it is even outside of Star Trek, this is a show, it's really good. Um, I understand the, the fans were furious, you know what? Because every time Star Trek changes, the fans get furious, right? Yeah. When Star Trek changed from TOS to TNG, oh my gosh, do you remember, do you remember the rants furious. about Worf's new head ridges? Yes, <laughs> yes, they, it, they got furious. I know William doesn't, but the rest of us do. Hey, <laughs> hey, look, look, look! I wasn't gonna say like there's a big difference. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm. Oh, sorry. No, no, no! I'm gonna need you. To, I'm gonna need you to. to, to there's to, not a big difference. To flesh that ahead. out, William. Yeah, was, go ahead. A big difference between people being there's, mad about war and people thing. being mad about Wolf's headpiece is a result of missing wardrobe. That's perfectly valid. Like it's a piece of missing wardrobe, so they had to make a new one. Someone stole it, or some some crap like that. That's what happened. This was an completely entire different makeover. They didn't even look like Klingons anymore. They looked like a bunch of lizards. Yeah, yes, because, because like, yes, because why would they explain that from another planet? Very well, and I still stand behind that story, Team Flox. No, so, people so, from TOS another planet TOS TOS should look Klingons, more alien. TOS Klingons more alien. were a racist stereotype. Yep. Yeah. Ain't they're all black, dude. In Star Trek, that? dude, they were all black, it's not even, it's and then, not even and then they were white and that. painted black. It's, uh, it, it, it's, the, it's not that they're black necessarily. It's that they are Russian, but they're a very specific subset of Russian. That's why you get the Fu Manchu kind of thing going on. Uh -huh. So they're actually supposed to be um, from the Eastern Bloc Russian 
areas like Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, stuff like that. I mm -hmm. thought that the new Klingons were awesome because it, it, it presented a variety of hues of their, of their skin color, just like we have on Earth, right? right? We talked about this. We and talked it, about this it, when, it, when we started. They had black ones and gray ones and sort of tan ones and... They had different outfits on, and they had. It wasn't. It wasn't homogenized. I thought it was awesome because it gave them, it, it, you know, it, it gave them diversity. Absolutely. And before then, Klingons had no nothing diversity. To, and it has nothing to do with all, at all with the fact that Discovery had such a much bigger budget. Yeah. It, well, it does, but. <laughs> well, getting but, back. Yeah. But but that, that's what it is. It, like when you look at the first Klingon, what they could do with them. And then you look at the second Klingon, what they could do with them, and then you move forward 20 years, they can do something else with them. Keith? My only problem is that I hate they speak Klingon all the time because I like I like to watch rewatch the show while I'm cooking or doing something around the house. Well, that's fine. I don't want to look at it. Keith? Well, getting back to Burnham, uh, I, I rewatched the Vulcan Hello today, and I will say that there's an expectation that we have gotten of our Starfleet officers, that they are trained, they are the best of the best. And it made very clear, very quickly, that Burnham did not go through the process that other Starfleet officers had gone through. And it, it, it early in season one, they find out she's a graduate, not of Starfleet Academy, but of the Vulcan Science Academy. And that she oh, was right. then brought okay. to the Shenzel to be the first officer under uh, Giorgio without uh, coming straight into Starfleet. Was she there? Was she there to be the first officer? Yes. Okay. Like the Yeah, I mean, there's there's almost there's almost a flavor like of mechanism here um, yeah. that we're we're kind of. We're we're kind of making a nod towards Sarek by bringing on his adopted his adopted daughter, but also this kind of she's weird because she's the human Vulcan, right? It's a I mean, let's I mean let's be real. Those initial those initial costumes were just amazing, though. This is the first time we've had a human that was a Vulcan, right? Uh, it, that. It, this is the first time we have Vulcan had a culture. human. Yeah. That was a Vulcan. It that was has raised never happened before. Culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but right. Now, for now, people have picked up on that point about her as a way to get, say, go with the Mary Sue argument. But then, of course, we find out not until short treks way after the season one is over that Saru had the same thing. Mm -hmm. Saru was just picked up on the planet by Lieutenant Giorgio, and comes on the ship that she's on at the time and then stays with him, stays with her when she gets her own command. So Yeah, but we don't know where he went through. We don't know where he went through. He does go to Starfleet Academy because he had to have learned all of those languages somewhere. Right. Uh, it's never... Well, they... they because you remember the, you remember the episode where um, yeah. everybody's yeah. speaking their, their native languages and the only person who can communicate is Saru? Yes, yeah. he, he, I think once he got there, he just started learning them. Uh, so, I, when, I so when y'all are talking about Saru, are we? Is this in the initial story, not the TNG story? But this is another Worf um, beginner story. Wait, what? 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 Well, okay. So <laughs> Worf was raised on Earth, okay. Yes. yes. And he went to Starfleet Academy. Yeah. And um, if I recall correctly, um, it was like he was picked up somewhere after something happened at Kittimer. And no. his father was labeled a traitor. Yeah. So okay, the Romulans attacked the Klingon outpost at Kittimer, mm -hmm. and and a Federation starship were the ones that came to their rescue. Mm -hmm. And the chief, well, not the chief, one of the engineering crew was Sergei Rojenko on that Excelsior class ship, and found Worf and took him in as his adopted son. That's what I'm talking. Right. About. And took him back to. Raised in oh, so so out. so basically, Will, you're you're kind of relaying this as like the same lines of Michael Burnham being raised by uh, Vulcans, right? That's mm -hmm. that sort of same thing. 
Well, yeah. Just going back to what we discussed last week. But, but Michael Burnham, having... I think, uh, falls into being human way more quickly than Worf did. Because Worf was actually Klingon, right? So, but, but Michael Burnham was not actually Vulcan. So she falls into the human sort of ways very quickly. And, uh, I feel like it. I feel like it took her a season to do that. Uh, yeah, but still, quickly, I mean, Worf is still dealing with it the all seven seasons, right? Worf is. It, it, I'm sorry, after seven seasons, because he went to DSI after that. He's still a Klingon. Well, I, I would argue that Kling, that uh, Worf is cosplaying as a Klingon, because as was pointed out in Deep Space Nine by Jadzia, that he is so into the honor that he doesn't realize that Klingon society is hollow and falling apart. There, there is more screen time of Worf than there is of any other Star Trek character. Can I pick? I don't really feel comfortable saying that Worf is cosplaying. Um, because I think Worf is in a really interesting position of being a representation for immigrant immigrant kids in the sense that, you know, he is being raised in a situation where he doesn't have his culture and he's trying to hold on to that culture. So I don't want to downplay the significance of that. And right. I think calling it cosplay does. I, I but just what wonder. I love about Discovery is the diversity of the Klingons. I love the diversity. I love how there are different ones doing different things, wearing different clothes. I just love it. Like, okay, okay well, so I'm Michael Burnham, Will, 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 Will. And then, and then, and then after that, yeah, yes, absolutely, Jermaine. I just wanted to like piggyback off of what Keith mentioned earlier because I don't know if any of you have any of y'all seen the movie Ted. Yeah, Michael Michael Dorn cosplays as a war <laughs> in, in that in, in a scene, and it's pretty fucking cool. He really does. And like he no wearing idea. like a Klingon outfit. I, and I don't oversized, remember that. But... Oversized um shirt, <laughs> and, and he and he lo- and he looks like a wharf at a comic con <laughs> when he's right when he's actually a wharf. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Jimmy. So, <laughs> no, Michael Burnham, Michael Mark and Green. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jermaine. No, you got it. No, no, it's on you, bro. No, I just I, I just wanted to ask uh, Michael Burnham. Uh, so I said this last week. I really feel like her story is hasn't yet been fully told. We have a whole season that we have to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I am very careful about what I say about her um, as a as a as a leader in Starfleet. Star Trek. Um, and so I'm, I'm I'm very reticent to. Well, I. I I, I don't want to say too much. Um, I really do appreciate her character. Um, I think we've only really seen a sh- uh, her as captain for a short amount of time. And so when it comes to being a captain, um, I am saving my my opinion about her. Um, I think we will see more of Michael Burnham in the future. I think in about 10, 15 years from now, America will, uh, the world will see her character a lot differently. Well, the thing about Michael being a captain is that they were still going to have her solve more problems than a captain is supposed to solve. Right? Like, can you flesh that one out for us? Like, uh, like Michael Burnham is front and center, and she solved most of the problems. And like every season, Michael Burnham is the person solving them. But as a captain, you're supposed to let other people solve certain problems. And I think that they're going to have a hard time with like saying, "We." We're I mean, James keep, Kirk would beg to differ. Yeah, we're trying to keep this person front and center, but we. You said James Gunn? Kirk. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Kirk. Well, first of all, all Kirk did was talk to a deities that can that can annihilate anybody out of annihilating anybody, right? And That's also like, made a bazooka <laughs> out of a bunch of rocks. <laughs> right. I'm not gonna lie. But Michael the, did come from the, the Kirk part, Like, like how are, like let's talk about Kirk. How are all these entities? In the in, in the galaxy, 
not running into each other. And hey, well, are. Are. They they are. I can name Where's at least three. Go ahead, William. You said you can name at least three. Okay, we've seen a lot of run-ins with the wormhole alien, aliens or the prophets. We've seen a fight between the fake god and um, Cyborg. That was fun. Oh, do you remember the one where uh, Kirk le left them? No. In, I, I think it was a TOS. That's us, that's us as humans running into them. Uh -huh. These, uh, these, these de deities was have not run into each other. There was a TOS episode that I remember clearly. Um, Keith, you might have to help me on this one. Where... Um, like they were just like by the end of this particular episode, they were like left fighting for all of eternity, stuck in in between transporter worlds. What which one was that? It was oh, uh, it's, on, it's, it's the it's the one where different versions of the guy um, are fighting oh. each other across time. Oh gosh, what is it? Uh, it's, uh, it's, the yeah. Armageddon factor. It's, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's what it is. That's what it is. Wait, wait, what what there is it? Are you talking about TOS? TOS. TOS. It's season one. I remember that that one kind of moved me. Like, but what I'm saying is that all these deities are never running into each other. Like, that we know of. It's a big universe, also. Galaxy. Big universe. universe. Doesn't have to be a galaxy. We're not that's limited. A brain universe. That, that's, and in that's, and in that's, fact, that's, that's, one of the that's things. That's one of the things that I think really Star Trek really did well until Discovery. Don't you talk um, bad about Discovery? Hold Don't on. you do that? Oh, no. Nope. But Hold on, because I think Discovery kind of fell a little bit into this trap of we all have to be connected. Like we all have to, like for example, there was no reason for us to pick up, you know, Saru, right? It didn't have to. It, it didn't have to be the Shunjo that picked up Saru. Um, well, it was the Shunjo that picked up, but it was Georgia. It was. It was, it was, it was Giorgio and you know, like we don't all have to do that because it's a really big universe and we can all interact with people differently. And you know, it, we meet people that we will never see again. Well, that's um, always been the word universe with the word galaxy. There's commonly been a problem throughout Star Trek of where they have to shoehorn in. Oh, you remember this person? No, I am using universe deliberately here because if we're talking about, if we're also talking about the gods, Q is not limited to our galaxy. Mm -hmm. And Discovery is not limited to our galaxy either. That is interesting that Q has not been in Discovery at all. We don't know that yet. We don't know that. I said he hasn't been. I mean, oh, right? Like, yeah. Well, how long did it take him to show up in Voyager? I think about three mm. years. Season two? Okay. Well, uh, another thing. So, as far as Star Trek is concerned, the first time that they ever met Q was during uh, TNG. So, mm -hmm. mm, I don't know. Well, they're in the future. I see what you're saying. They're in the future now, so it's a possibility that, that they would see um, Q. I got it. Okay. Well, they said in uh, in one of the first episodes in the far future that they haven't heard from the Q collective in, in a long time. In you know, 500 years or so. Yeah. Oh. But, yeah, we, we find out. I mean, the reason we haven't seen the Q yet in discovery in, in the older time and is in the very first T episode TNG when we're introduced to Q, he said, you have gone too far. You have extended yourself too far and I'm here to stop you. And right. So, I mean, discovery is pretty limited to alpha and beta quadrant at this point. So would you have wanted to see Q in the first season of discovery? No, no, uh, no. Either that or some form of Trelane would have been okay. No. So oh, Trelane's TOS. Let him stay there. Right. And there's some argument that Trelane might have been a proto Q. Right. As a I think the first season of Discovery was fucking awesome. Like, but we're yeah. also doing a really bad job of talking about Michael Burnham. I'm actually yeah. being good today, guys. I'm yeah. I'm drinking my water. Okay, well done. Well done. So Michael Burnham um went through a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of shit. Like he was. It, uh, uh, Keith was talking about uh, the battle of the binary stars. Do you? Uh, for, okay, so first of all, I don't understand why people think she is the cause of the war when she actually was trying not to have the war. You mean like Cisco? Um, well, well, the yeah. argument could be made: who drew first blood? Right. She ki she killed Rejak, the, the torchbearer. She yes. she killed the first Klingon in the war. No, but yes, but she t 
told them we need to fight. If they would have fired on the first ship, then they wouldn't have brought all the other ships, right? That was her. That was her thought. I well, mean, because what she literally does is she she I mean she engages in mutiny, and take, tries to take over the ship, then fires on. I mean, because with with the information that they had, and remember, a lot of this is retrospective, right? Um, we had access to the fact that, you know, they, the Klingons were, were gunning for some sort of conflict because they needed this conflict as a galvanizing force and a unifying force, right? We know that that's going on, but the Federation doesn't. And the Federation doesn't have access to those records uh, when Burnham is imprisoned. And right? she knows they need to fire first because she talked to um, Sarah. She thought, I mean, right. She she wants to do his Vulcan hello, right? Which is right. we're Vulcan gonna come hello. out, we're gonna come out, we're gonna come out of the out of the gates. Um this is the problem is is this runs counter entire as as Giorgio points out, this runs counter to Federation policy. Yeah. Um, so she is breaking Federation policy. She this this conflict starts off and again no one else has access to this. And it's really easy for Federation analysts at this point to say, hey, look, you know, this lady took, takes over the ship in order to fire against our policy. She breaks all of this policy. And this is... It doesn't fire. And, like, and I think she... I mean, she goes against direct orders to do this. Yeah. And it ultimately starts the basis of what is a very bloody... But she doesn't fire. Right. Like, she doesn't, she doesn't, doesn't stop, sir, before they fire. Yes. But, and then the beacon is lit, which draws the Klingon houses. To the right. Button. So if she would have fired, then the beacon would not have been lit. Uh, it, it, she no. literally, Georgia literally comes in and stops her two seconds before the beacon is lit. So even if they would have fired, say that the beacon wouldn't have been lit, it, I folk was already, probably already on the beacon. Yeah. yeah I mean, the up. entire point, and the entire point is, is that that posture gives the Klingons the excuse that they need it. Yeah. And remember the, the key thing of that battle is she tried not to, but of course in trying to save Giorgio, she ends up killing Takuvma. And Takuvma was the leader of basically this religious fanaticist Klingon movement. And once he's dead... He becomes a martyr. He becomes a martyr. And but the movement and, wasn't and, started yet. The movie no, yes, hasn't it started. Yes, until, yes, until, it was. Until, yes, it was. Until the, was beacon, until the beacon was lit. Oh, dude, the, the ship was there to light the beacon. The group on the ship was the movement already. He wanted to bring all 24 houses under his movement, and that's why he was lighting the beacon. I understand she, that, but, I, but it wasn't... But, go ahead. I'm sorry. When, when she killed the Kuzma, that left the power vacuum among the Klingon leadership and allowed Cole to step in and then the Klingons to basically run amok with the war, no, not in the way Takuma ever imagined to do it. And that made the war completely different. So you can say that the Kling the war was bloodier, the war was more because of the fact that she killed Takuma and then allowed Cole to seize control of Klingon forces. I, I okay. My thing is that the rest of the Klingons didn't give a shit about Takuma, right? Before he did the beacon, correct. Before the so, beacon. So right? I guess my so question the to you then, Jason, is what are we arguing about? Are we arguing are we arguing about it from the Klingon perspective or are we arguing about it from the Federation perspective? Because Burnham from a Federation perspective, Burnham's Michael Burnham is, hold on. Burnham's culpability is being assessed in light of the Federation perspective. And from the Federation perspective, there's a pretty clear link between her actions and the subsequent conflict. Mm, and, I, I having, guess, and, guess, discuss, and discussing what would have or would not have happened from the Klingon perspective is irrelevant to that assessment of guilt. If I you're guess my argument, you do. I'm sorry, go ahead, Will. No, that's the question I'm trying to figure out because that's why I'm kind of like listening in listening mode. Like, where where are we going in this? Are we justifying or not justifying our actions? Are we looking at it from a Federation policy perspective or a Klingon um, view perspective? Like, I I'm trying to figure out like where what is the my argument is 
that if Michael Burnham would have succeeded in firing on the Klingons, that they would have never launched the beacon and they would have never started the war. And I think that's wrong. So I think Michael Burnham was right with her Vulcan, the, the, the Vulcan hello, right? And they would have never, there would have never been a war if Michael Burnham were, uh, was allowed. No. Marie disagrees. I yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude, but I, I do really You're strongly rude. agree. Um, because, you know, the thing about it is, is like, he's floating, like, Takuba is floating on the ship of the dead, which, you know, even if the, the Klingons are, are not, are downplaying its cultural significance, if she had fired and caused damage to the ship, then the Klingons would have retaliated. Yes, that one ship. No, no, not that one ship. The Klingon Empire no, because because the Klingon Empire did not care about that one ship. They were not going to like retaliate. The, the the Klingon Empire was all doing their own fucking thing. No. Right, but right? Like, it's like the uh, point is... who are the who, who are the guys who are the guys in Voyager? Like like the well, well, hold on, get, get get that thought together. Let's get another voice in, William. So I only have one question, and if we can, we can segue further deep into the. Um, ongoing story or what we have of Michael Burnham. So just one question and then, and then let's move on from there. Um, what evidence throughout all of Trek do we have that firing on the Klingons first is like some sort of hello sign of respect or something? The only the evidence we have is, is from uh, the, the first episode when she talks to Derek. Because the closest thing that I can think of, the closest thing, is uh, Deep Space Nine when uh, Nog stood up to Martok. Mm -hmm. That's the closest thing that I can think of. Any other time, you wouldn't catch me dead or alive, rather, um, firing on on, a, on the ship. Of yeah, the and, I don't think, I, and I truly don't think. I, I mean, I truly don't think that that I I don't remember enough to say whether or not they cared, quote unquote, about this particular ship. But the problem is, is that if the Federation had fired on a cultural relic, that would have been an amazing, that would have been a galvanizing unifying force, which is one of the reasons that Takuvma wanted to do it. It just happened that Takuvma died um, in the subsequent conflict. And this goes back to Keith's point, right? Which is why, which is why the war looked very different. Like if Takuvma had been in charge, it would have been, a, it would have been much more focused on unification as opposed to, as opposed to the violence, I guess is, is, did, did I, no. Am I getting that right, Keith? You know, I'll put it in our historical context here in Planet Earth. World War I was started because a group called The Hand had tried, uh, executed the uh, Archduke Ferdinand. Archduke Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary. Mm -hmm. And then, because he was killed, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Germany, because of their defensive alliance with Austria-Hungary, then declared war. Russia, because of their support for the Slavic peoples in Serbia, then declared war. Their defensive alliance with France yep. brought France into the war. Then the Germans decided to attack France through Belgium, which yep. caused Belgium to get in, which brought the British in, and that's how we get World War One, because of yep. a, a singular group taking, taking action on their own. They weren't looking to start a war, of course. They were looking... To ch they were looking. They, well, they were starting to start. I mean, they, they were starting. They, they, they did want to, to 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 start a conflict, but they were hoping for liberation. Yeah, they didn't want world war. They wanted um, yeah. in, independence for Serbia. Yes, and that's what they were you know, aiming for. That's I, was, I mean, you could say in some ways they got it, in some ways they didn't. But uh, that that's the way we can look at Kuzma's group mm -hmm. that they wanted to restore the Klingon Empire, because as we find out in that first episode, the, the Klingons are basically, I no one's talked to them in a hundred years, and it's the Empire is in shambles. Now, we're supposed to be talking about Burnham, and we're very focused on the first two episodes of what is now five seasons of Discovery. Right. She made a lot more questionable decisions. Like, should she really have trusted Emperor George, em, Emperor Giorgio of the Terran Empire? Should she... <laughs> I, I I found it like um. I mean, could could we have found a way that Jojo discovery into 
our future. Yeah. Giorgio really understood their relationship, and I feel I feel like Giorgio really had a connection with Michael Burnham of the Mirror Universe, right? Like, like they had a connection. Wherever that connection that, is, that's literally kind of the point. Yeah, yeah that that is the point. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the Prime Universe Burnham saw Giorgio as a uh, adoptive mother, mm-hmm. more so than, in some ways than Amanda. And we find out in the Mirror Universe that it was Giorgio that adopted it, Burnham. Burnham. So yeah. she was her literal adoptive mother in the Mirror Universe. I don't I I mean I think it's yeah. going to be really I'm really kind of looking forward to seeing where we're going to go from this last you know th- this last ep- this last season because the burnham we got in this last season was definitely moving into her captain her captaincy um mm-hmm. but she was also in a lot of ways trying to figure out how to reintegrate um with that captaincy right because we'd had that, I mean, because she was still reeling from having had the experience of being with Book on her own in this sort of Wild West future. Um, and she gets better about it, right? But now now she's she doesn't have Book anymore. Because Book has been sent to, you know, I'm like... Not a prison planet exactly, but he's definitely he's definitely being sent for to make amends. And so now Burnham is going to be on her own in a very real way. And we've never quite seen her do that. I just think they need to do something about her hair. Well, I think her hair is fine now. Actually, you know what? I you know what? I was going to uh I didn't do it. I was going to like present all her hairdos to like black women and be like, okay, what do you like? Which one is better? But I didn't do that. But I, I like her hair and the binary stars. That was my favorite Burnham hair. And this is where we're going? Yeah. Like, 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 this is where we're going. We hold, can, hold on, hold on, hold on. First of all, what are you doing? First of all, black women in the center chair. We can first talk of all, about if you talk about black of, women, oh. if you talk about black women, you have to talk about their hair. This me, me, Jermaine, and Robin already covered this topic on Black Track. That was the first episode. You remember, Marie? Like, it was the very first thing we well, covered. All invited. the black hairstyles. I wasn't invited, so whatever. You know, like I, 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 I don't know. That was before your time, Jason. That was before uh, your time. I don't know. I really like. I mean, I don't know. Just from an aesthetic perspective, I really like the braids. I I love the evolution. I love the evolution. I got that. They were real pretty. I think braids is like so like. I don't know what the word is. It's just like. It's just like. Oh, we'll just go. To, we'll just we'll just do braids. It's like okay what? when a black when a black woman goes on vacation, she's just like I'm just gonna get braids. Wait, what? It's like, oh my god, dude. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so let me ask you a question. <laughs> let me ask you a question. I, I, I want to change the subject just a little. Oh, hold on, I'm talking to Will. You, I'm talking to Will. Will right now. Is, he's not okay. understanding, and that's fine. Yeah, no, Jermaine. Yeah, Jermaine, please. Please, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you all what um, what types of challenges did we see uh, Michael Burnham face, and how did she overcome? I'm more interested in how she overcame her challenges. Um, let's start with Keith. Keith, um, can you name one challenge that she I'm faced and how she overcame? Well, when we saw her rejoin Discovery in season three, having been having a year in the future with book as Marie brought up. She really has this uh, question of faith in, she had given herself into Starfleet from once she joined the Shenzhou. And now here she's been away from Starfleet for a year and possibly thinking that she may never even find the discovery again, let alone find the future version of the Federation and Starfleet. She really started to lose faith in her belief system there. And 
it took all of season three for her to find her swooning. I mean, she even had her mother come back in to question whether or not she really believed what she claimed she believed. So it, it, that was, I really enjoyed seeing the fact that she didn't just pick up right where she left off once this discovery showed up and picked her up, that there was still several episodes of her trying to find her place there. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't heard much from you today, Will, so we'll go with Will. <clears throat> Throughout most of Discovery that I've seen, and I don't think it's really much of a fault to her own because of where she was raised, how she was raised, how what she's endured. But, you know, she's still a grown-ass grown woman, but still. She's always kind of had a problem letting go. Like, she's always had that issue. It's like every new season, you can find something new. She has attachment issues. And I get that because of her upbringing. She really wasn't... I mean, yeah, I mean, there was Spock and... Um, Sarah doing, I guess, the best th that he could, but you love it's books. Just, it's, I feel like I feel like she didn't really truly experience un pure unconditional love. She loved until books though. later on, much later on, like e like even in season what was it two three that they, um she was at odds with Spock over something that they miscommunicated over in, in their childhood. Like it's stupid. it's stupid. Like th th that's one. Um, incredibly the relatable. most recent season, um, going after book chasing back and forth. Um, and this whole wild goose chase thing. Um, when the whole crew, crew and their chihuahua and their mama knows, um, that they're in love with each other. Like, all right, great, awesome. My turn. You know, she had a problem it's letting go. And then the one with the the red angel learning that it was her or her mother um she she was chased she looks for some and we as humans always do that don't we like we kind of always like look for an enemy or we look for something or we look for some sort of purpose in her case she kind of has a problem letting go which is why i'm hoping that she does not have this issue in this new season i didn't see any indication of it in the, in the trailer which is awesome by the way um i like a new sense of advent adventure new aliens um, new relationships and not chasing the past again or chasing some alien that we saw in TNG making a reprise role or whatever. Um, so that's, um, I'm hoping that she learned something while Book was gone to whoever's point that made it earlier. She really is alone or was alone because I did see Book in this trailer. Um, I'm hoping during that time she matured and learned how to let go. That, I, I feel like that is interesting that um, yes, Michael Burnham hasn't had hasn't had real love the way humans have love, right? So she, she grew up with a Vulcan father. Maybe she only had it from her mother. I think maybe her mother gave it to her a little bit. Um, but her Vulcan father definitely didn't give it to her the way that a human would need it, right? Um, but she doesn't really get it until she gets with book. In season three, that's the first time that she is really with someone that actually loves her. And I think that you know that's you know that's terrible. Can you can you like imagine just growing up never actually feeling like someone loves you? Mm -hmm. So that's something that Michael Burnham has had to deal with, and we'll see how it projects in in season five, right? We we would like there to be a season seven, but there's not going to be a season seven, so we'll see how how that comes across in 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 season five. Murray, I think one of the more interesting aspects, or one of the more more interesting struggles that builds off of that, is that that was this inability to let go is that Michael Burnham really struggles um, to rely on the expertise of the people around her and to allow them to go and basically do what they need to do. Um, because Michael is definitely the sort of captain who's going to go out and be like, all right, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to 
like I'm going to go and put myself in danger and try to keep you from doing that with, instead of relying on, you know, her crew. And that's one of the things that she definitely learns over the course of the last season is how to basically, I mean, how to start to delegate. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do. And it's an especially hard thing to do, I think, for um, hyper achievers who are programmed like she is, that you have to do everything. You have to do as much as you possibly can in order to be worthy of affection. And, you know, that that sort of plays into a little bit of what we were talking about earlier, Jermaine, before we went on, on, on online. Um, she's taking it to a, she takes it to a very bad, like a very hard place. I don't want to say a bad place necessarily, but I don't think it's the healthiest of places. And so she has to figure out how to do that. And she's very much starting to do that um, by the very end. Like, I mean, you know, she lets Owo go into Fight Club, right? Which can we just have a moment to express? Can I just have a moment to express how much more of Owo I want to see? <laughs> oh yeah, that's, that's why I, I I was upset about um, the whole gray story was because I was like, well, there there's already people on the bridge that I want I mean, to know stories about, and now you're adding people to the show that I don't care about and I don't know. And you're making a whole story off of them. I was like, why are you not doing this with? Um, I mean, Owo can walk over me any point in time that she cares to. Right. <laughs> and and Dittmer, Dittmer as well. And Bryce. And, you know, all these people I just want stories from. And, but for some reason, you're, you're, you're making a whole another story about these other people that I don't. It was, it was sort of just like shoved in your face, basically. Right. <laughs> because, because it was transgender and, Whatever it was, like 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 the gay like uh, Colbert. Let him finish. Um, and Salmon was not shoved in your face. It was it was just part of the story, and we loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what just happened there. But, so, uh, so I just want. But, but, but well, hold on. Them, them being gay was not shoved in your in your face. It was just part of the story, and we loved it. Like we love Samet, we love Colbert, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it it was just great. I just felt like mm -hmm. the whole gray story was like shoved in your face when we could have been talking about uh, a Obu or Dittmer or Bright. <laughs> So one challenge that um, I, I was going I was going to talk about the trauma that she faced when her parents died and then boom, all of a sudden her mom is still alive. I was going to talk about that, but we've kind of sort of talked about it. But another um, challenge that she faced, um, I feel, is learning that the person that she was in love with, we, we tend to forget um, him, Ash Tyler slash Volk. Um, was or is cling half Klingon or is Klingon? Is Klingon. Klingon. You look yeah, at it. I watch that. Um, I know and so that. she's having to wrestle with this reality and and wondering, you know, do was it real? Yes. Or was it part of the programming? Yes. Like yes. Yeah. And so like that's who a is this nigga right psychologically here? to deal with. Um, yeah, and then now all of a sudden, you know, this person is in a in a in the next season, um, someone that you have to work with. That's a lot for a person to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Right? Is is that person the person, or is that person not the person? Correct. All right. I know is is that that weird Klingon love scene was very traumatizing to me, and I will never watch it again. <laughs> oh, you mean when um when uh, when him and the uh. Laurel or whatever her name was, was was doing them. I don't know what was happening to him. He was having a flashback. Baby, I'm not watching that again. Keith, you're on mute. I'm not your baby. No, sorry. I was just saying because I remember when they went on hi hiatus because we remember they split season one in half, and we saw, you know, Ash Tyler break his programming and kill Colbert, and then, uh. You know, we come back later and 
I don't know. Wait a minute. Am I just remembering this? Just go oh. with it. Okay. We'll correct you. Well, I just remember when they went on break. Uh, I think Star Trek.com put up a poll of, oh no, put no, it was on Facebook. It was like, where, would you want to see more of Voke or Ash Tyler in the second half of the season? And I, for the first time, I thought about it and goes, you mean they're, well, we know they're the same person, right? And I had it, it hadn't occurred to me until that moment. It was before it was, it was in in the episode. So I'm trying to remember where it actually broke. I out. was I was wrong. I will say I was absolutely wrong because people in, on other um, Star Trek like uh, groups were saying, I think that Tyler is Volk. And I was like, that's bullshit. No, he's not. And I was 100% wrong on that. Like, whatever. But if you just killed him off, I, I would have been fine. Like, yeah, both I, of them. I found Star Trek fans have been very good at pulling, you know, picking out the twist before they happened. Like, when they first talked about going to the Mirror Universe, somebody saw somebody post, wouldn't it be funny if Giorgio was the Emperor? Right. Right, and just right. like how when we were watching Picard season three, somebody said, "Wouldn't it be funny if LaForge rebuilt the Enterprise D?" Yeah, I, Star Trek, Star Trek fans. Can we, can we not bring up Picard at all? Not one okay. bit. Make it so. Yeah, let's let's, let's make that so. So, w do we have any predictions, Keith? Just you know, just because you right? you, I mean, you mentioned it, are, any predictions? Are, are teasing stuff out? No, no, no. I don't want predictions, dude. Let's no. Just have, just, yeah, but I do. So we're gonna do that. Pontificate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're we're led to believe that at some point, somehow, it's going discovery is going to loop back to Calypso, the short trek episode. Where the this the, where the discovery is left alone for a thousand years with Zora, and of course in Calypso it was before they had jumped to the far future, so it was still the discovery as it appeared in season one, not the discovery A as they rebranded it in the far future to hide the fact that this was a time traveling all, ship. Why is that dude? That dude would be an awesome character. Like whatever yes. whatever he does. He would be an awesome character. And yeah, no, I'm 100% behind bringing Aldous Hodge back. Yeah. But, but 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 we won't because he's, you know. In How the do you future, know that? I, I guess I don't know. Keith, I mean, what but, else is the man yeah. doing? Come on. Come yeah. on. What else is the man doing? I don't know. Well, he has other things he's doing. But yes, I would. <laughs> I, we need we need craft back. We need funny face back. <laughs> but uh, we have. They, we've already seen with the trailer. The most recent trailer that came out that there is seeming the there is an idea of that they're coming to an end that, that burnham senses that they're coming to an end so i hope that they do wrap up her story in a satisfying way and my biggest hope is that when they starfleet academy eventually launches that it is a spin-off and we get professors tilly and saru with burnham sometimes stopping in to say hi that and also let's, let's not forget that we need daddy vance Yes, what? yes, we do. Who? Admiral Vance. Oh man, okay. The mummy I'm not man. I'm embarrassed to call him Daddy Vance. I'm just not like. Yeah. To me, he's the mummy man. None of this is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, do we, as a whole, uh, do do we like Michael Burnham, Tanika? Yes. Uh, did, uh, are we are we are we thumbs up for this for this lady? I'm thumbs up for this lady. I never disliked her. I disliked her writing initially. I never disliked her. I dislike. So if, if she came over here right now, I'd be like, first of all, I'd be fucking ecstatic. But <laughs> I would be like, stop whispering so much and stop crying so much. But that's a direct. Like if the director's not telling you that, that's a director thing. Okay. Let me let me just say this point. It got to the point where I would, I would watch an episode, and if she cried, I was ready to be upset at the people complaining that she cried again. I wasn't right. mad that she cried. I was mad that there was going to be fans complaining that she yes. was crying. I understand. That pissed saying. me off far more than her actually crying. I understand. Because, I mean, every single time was justified. 
let's talk about the amount of trauma the woman's going through, right? <laughs> like we've got the Vogue business. We've got um, the Dead fact that she, is, that she has been flung into the far future. We've got the fact that she was marooned in the far future on her own. She's been, you know, I'm not she's, she's not a discovered reason. the betrayal I'm of not her not not father. Reason. She had to deal with the fact that her, like, her mother, what you know, got flung into the far future and became a Romulan nun. Um, <laughs> then, like, and then, you know, like, what, I mean, once her, once her mama shows up with a sword, she's like, what the fuck? And then, like, and then yeah. she's got to handle the fact that she's got to put the Federation back together. And yeah. on top of that, her boyfriend's world gets destroyed and he goes a little nuts. I understand and to, what you're saying. She has to deal Marie. with like this I incredibly difficult it. coworker and it. Federation president. If she doesn't cry, <laughs> what's wrong with you with her no because <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm just saying that like i mean it's a, i'm it's, ecstatic it's, that she gets to cry i'm ecstatic yeah. that we're acknowledging that this is hard that this is not something that she how often do you want to see me cry i feel cry? like if you're not crying something is really wrong i would argue really quick that there are not enough tears in star trek as a whole yeah. They are not enough. They are not enough. So, so much. And I'm going to say this, and I really think we should close out. So Jordy, much, Jordy wouldn't been, cry. We've been raised. Yes, Jordy cry. We've been he raised cry as adults to died. not cry, to hold it all in, to keep to ourselves. And we're expected to be this strong man, strong woman, strong black man, strong black woman. And we're supposed to just hold it all together. And while, while completely ignoring the fact of all the trauma that has went, went through, like, come on, the point of Star Trek is for it to be relatable. And I am going to argue right here, right now, that there are not enough tears in Star Trek. I am personally confused that there was an outrage at Michael Burnham crying at all. At all. Oh, why, no, why, that, why, I mean, why is that an issue? I, yeah, I'm no. very confused. That, that, that's an issue. That's an issue because she's a black woman. Right. And so, and, and that, and probably among other things that I am completely ignorant to at this moment. So, I, I I I'm glad that she cried. Hell, I thought Deanna didn't cry enough. Like I I, I wanted more people to just let Deanna the cry. Yeah, the only cried. person not who, as much as she should have. The only person who cried that uh, that I saw that at least from my perspective and my generation that I saw was Cisco. Like I saw those tears. I saw well, him cry a couple of times. Well, and remember how people reacted to Picard, remember how people reacted to Picard crying in generations. People were oh, upset man. that Picard mm -hmm. cried that his brother and nephew were killed in a fire. <laughs> okay, so my only, my only, okay, so right, my only right, frustration right. with that is like we go from literally like a normal conversation to like boohooing. Like there's yeah. the transition there was weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. and th and that's a transition issue. But but as well, far the as the transition like, wasn't weird, I, I think I think William has an actual real point. I think well, I think I think what real what William is saying is like. These motherfuckers are going through all this shit all the fucking time. Why is nobody crying ever? Kirk watched his brother die. That is what William is saying. He, he and was presented, uh, presented several times with people he knew and loved that turned against him or right. died or betrayed him. And at, at no point ever did you see him take it any other than, you know, stiff upper lip right back to being like, the captain. Like, I mean, like, there was was weird weird like his reaction to Miramani's death is underwhelming. Like my my sister died watching TV, and I cried over that. My nephew, her actually her 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 son, killed himself last summer, and I we cried over that. Right, right. So it's like, yeah, the crying is actually a real thing, yeah. and. People right. should be okay to do it when they need to do it. And I tried watching the Daily Show on Monday because John Stewart's dog died. <laughs> okay. White people and their dogs. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was uh... <laughs> cat. <laughs> Actually, if my Pretty dog good. died, if my dog died, I would be sad. What, what the fuck is that? William. William? Okay. You're about to All be right, assimilated guys. because we're about to close out. <laughs> All right. So, same bet. Doggy. Yes. All right. So, uh, next week, same bat time, same bat channel. 
Yes, and don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Until next week, see ya. Beautiful. Wait, baby. Jason, on a scale of 1 to 10, how serious are you being right now? I gotta know. I'm serious, dude. You got, like, 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 like 10 I'm, out of 10 I'm serious, serious. serious or picking on Michael P serious? Which one? There is, there is no temperature I'm, in space. It's not cold. What are you doing? Okay, wait, wait, wait. Who is somebody? Oh, doing dear it? God. It just it's got better. because you said his name. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the party, Michael. No, no. That is not no. how we're going to end the episode no. because Keith no. actually has, like, a legitimate news update. He knows yeah. shit, and we should possibly, like, Convey that knowledge that's, that's my favorite people. line he he knows shit <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a black and red mound move it's like why are you describing yourself what the hell um hello from hey Adam. virgil hey hey virgil welcome hello virgil welcome who are you who <laughs> 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 <laughs>